The market is open and we're starting to see it pick up from just last week where we saw near enough red right across the whole S&P 500. And one of the industries that's been hit hard the most has been Big Pharma. When we just look at that, large names down double digits. Eli Lilly, negative 13%, Amgen, negative 14 and others which have been hit very, very hard. Now, today our focus is on one of those that have been hit the most, Eli Lilly. In fact, just today, it's down around 3.5%. And when we look over the last month, this is a company which you could argue very high quality, down 21%. So is there a great opportunity to take advantage of this drop? Now, first, let's understand why the drop was, whether it is undervalued, and what we believe the intrinsic value to be. So no surprise by now, everyone knows that Trump is picking RFK Jr. as essentially the Health and Human Services Secretary, and that is one of the large reasons why these big pharma companies have in fact started to fall, and they do claim that he is a vaccine skeptic and conspiracy theorist. These are the words that are from this article, and therefore investors are starting to get a little bit shaky with their holdings. Now, interestingly, whether you love him, whether you hate him, Jim Kramer, a CNBC very popular analyst, does believe that this ultimately won't affect the junk food and drug industry. But again, something just to bear in mind. Ultimately, though, when we did look at their latest earnings, it wasn't the greatest by any means. In fact, the headline gives it all away. They've missed the estimates. They also cut their profit guidance. And we're going to discuss a little bit about this. And it isn't just this company, another company that we do like a lot, Novo Nordisk, another one which is down very strongly. Like we said, pretty much the whole industry has been affected. So let's firstly start off with their full year guidance, which they have dropped. They believe now EPS to be around 1302 to 1352, down from the 16s that they had expected just over a few months ago. And they've also lowered their top line 45.4 to 46 from the previously mentioned 46.6 billion. Now, you might think, you know, these are very marginal decreases, but unfortunately, companies do get punished very severely, like Eli Lilly. And rightly so, these are, when we take a look, trading at very, very high forward valuation. So in terms of the EPS, it did unfortunately come under 118 versus the 147 that was expected. 11.44 on the top line, as we can see, 12.11 billion anticipated. So quite substantial misses in our opinion. We can also see that the revenue for some of their products have also come in under quite substantially and therefore no surprises Eli Lilly has been hit not just with the RFK appointment but also their earnings was very poor. Now granted down 21% over the last month but we also noticed over the last year they have underperformed the S&P up 22%. When you do zoom out, look at the full picture. This is a company that has significantly outperformed the S&P as a whole, up 968%. If you reinvest the dividends, you would be looking at a slightly better picture. In terms of the 52-week range, well, right now trading in the mid to lower end, we can see 52-week high, $973. And Seeking Alpha and Wall Street believe this is a company that you should be buying right now. Quant, as always, giving this company a hold. In terms of the forward yield, 0.7%, and the forward P looking very high at just under 57. Now, when we take a look at the actual earnings, what we can see is moving forwards, they are expecting mammoth growth to the EPS on a year-on-year -year basis. But ultimately, when we take a look back, they did miss the recent quarter by 29 cents, giving them a 75% track record. Nonetheless, if you do believe in management and their forecast, they're expecting 22.6 on the EPS for December 2025, which in turn will lower significantly the forward P to around 33.01. So what about the underlying metrics? Let's take a look. First one, dividend safety score looking very safe. We'll cover these two valuation models soon, but what we can in fact see a nice double digit 15% increase to the dividend in December last year, signaling to us that over the next few weeks, we are anticipating another increase. Now reaffirmed last week, in fact, their dividend is very safe, which means in turn, dividend cut highly unlikely. So in terms of the key metrics from the 0709 Great Recession, Eli Lilly increased the dividend plus 4% growth, well above the average of the S&P's negative 12. And in terms of return, marginally outperformed 
negative 49, S&P negative 55. Now in the recent times, we have loved their dividend increases. In fact, 15% year on year over the last five years. But when we do zoom out over the last 20, not as glamorous, up around 6%. And we do know whilst they have been increasing the dividends for only nine years consecutively, they've been paying a dividend for 33 years without reducing it. So let's get to the first model based on the five year PE ratio. What we can see when zooming in over the last year, pretty much every single month bar November, this company has been trading severely overvalued. The blue tunnel reflecting the expected fair price right now though for the first time ever or in fact for the first time in the last year we should say this company is trading right towards the lower end so you could argue reasonable valuation slash slight possible undervaluation but remember we're not looking at any one of these valuation models in isolation and will conclude towards the end when we put it through our own valuation process now dividend yield theory tells us a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average so solely based on this model given the yield 0.72 severely lower than the five-year rolling this indicates to us overvaluation and when we do get to the metrics the first one being the free cash flow payout as always we draw your attention to that over the earnings which is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting and we want below 60 percent ultimately this gives us faith Companies like Eli Lilly can increase dividends at a double digit rate. Very inconsistent. Now, we do notice 2023 negative as free cash flow per share was negative. Good to see over the next 12 months expected to come down to 43%. So hopefully we can see a nice double digit increase this December for this company. Free cash flow per share over the longer term. We already noted that negative free cash flow is pretty much doubled from 2014 to 2022. Nice to see over the next 12 months expected to go from that negative to a very sharp positive, which is good to see. Ideally, we want this to have consistent increases over the longer term. In terms of their top line, 3 to 7% here, but really 3 to 4 just to keep up in line with inflation. Last few years, looking very good, bar 2022. If you go back further, we can see 2014 and 2017 have negative effects on their top line. And if we zoom out in a more numerical format, we can see growth from 20 billion in 2014 to 34 in 2023. Shares outstanding, as always, returning excess cash to shareholder pockets when companies buy back shares. Very inconsistent in their process over the longer term, but ultimately they have bought back around 10% from that 2014 position. Then we like to look at one of our favorite metrics, ROIC. 10% or more is typically where we look at, giving us faith management are able to effectively allocate their capital. Good to see not only above the minimum in 2014, but it been increasing over the longer term. 33% on a trading 12 month is something very, very good to know. We then get to the operating margin. Two things always we want to identify. First one, above the minimums, 12%. Yes, we can tick that off. Second one, and looking absolutely glorious, is that operating efficiency. Over the longer term, margins are increasing. 17% in 2014, 36 on a trading 12 month basis. And free cash flow margin also looking very good. Above the minimum, 5% on a year-on-year -year basis bar 2023 as we saw above 2024 they are expecting this to go back up to positive finally for the metric aspect we get to the net debt to EBITDA referencing the earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization below three is what we want that is what we get remember numbers below number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand and the reason we focus on this it correlates to both dividend safety and balance sheet strength now yes it has increased from 2014 to 2023 but great to see it's come down sharply on the trading 12 month and expected to come down even further over the next 12 months so management as part of their capital allocation are looking to deliver the balance sheet and therefore reducing that total debt which dividend safety score to be honest already looks very safe but always great to see as a shareholder companies do focus on paying down their debt and will focus onto the balance sheet shortly as well now, we also want to let you know we have released our latest free weekly article. Every single week, we drop one to your inbox on Monday morning. We talk about severely undervalued companies that we believe deserve your attention, as well as what's gone on in the market over the last few days. So click below, sign up, and you can start reading straight away. And you'll also be able to gain access to 40 undervalued stocks for the month of November. Lots of information for each, the upside that Wall Street themselves see over the next year. And on top of that, you can grab a copy of 22 undervalued dividend stocks 
that Wall Street themselves believe have the most upside right now in the S&P. So click below, sign up, and you can start reading straight away. We then move on to insider ownership around 0.13%, with around 1.2 billion worth of sales by these insiders over the last year. Q4, we see around 723,000, Q3, 393 million, and Q2, around 674 million. Now we'll show you who these insiders are, but as always, insider selling we don't believe is a bearish signal. They sell for many reasons, personal or financial, and the more recent one, as we can see, the chief accounting officer on the 8th of November, so around 10 days ago, sold in total around $723,000 worth of shares. Information though is here if you do want to note it for your own investment thesis. Institutional aspect, well, 83% ownership, around 22 billion worth of sales over the last year, pretty much double during the same time frame at around 46 billion. And when we do look at Q3, the more recent quarter, and in fact, over the last four quarters and in 2024, institutions are buying heavily into Eli Lilly. But as always, do your own due diligence just because institutions over Q3, the more recent quarter and the last year are buying. Always, always do your own due diligence. Never copy insiders or, in fact, institutions. Now we want to move on to the income statement. We've already talked about their top line revenue, as we can see, moving in the right direction over the long term. One thing, though, that we haven't covered is their bottom line net income. Does it give us a similar story? And what we can, in fact, note, looking very inconsistent on a year-on-year -year basis, no real upwards trajectory, going from around $2.4 in 2014, to 5.2 in December 2023. But as we can see on a year on year basis, there is no pattern, just something that we do want to flag to shareholders and in fact, potential shareholders. Then we move on to the balance sheet, a quick health check, total cash versus total debt. We notice their cash has been decreasing over the longer term, going from 4.8 billion in 2014 to 3.6 in the latest quarter. Isolation, as always, one number here won't give anything away which why we call it a health check, we compare it against their total debt, which we notice actually has been increasing at a fairly rapid rate. We're talking around four times, in fact, from 2014's 8.2 billion to 31 billion in the latest quarter. And that is a massive jump from the previous years. Again, things to consider and perhaps maybe to focus on when we look at our margin of safety later on. We can see their valuation grading at an F, no surprises. In terms of the P on a non-gap forward basis, 57 as we discussed earlier, sector at around 20.2. So if you're buying Eli Lilly now, even after the 20% drop, you are still paying a 181% premium to the overall sector. And that is reinforced no matter which valuation metric used, Eli Lilly is very expensive. Remember, it can be justified for companies to trade at a premium, but the question we want to answer is how much of a premium should we pay for Eli Lilly? Now, growth, they get an A+, which is good to see given they are trading at a hefty premium. Revenue growth, 27%, a lot better than the sector at 7. In fact, 295% better. In terms of revenue growth moving forwards, there or thereabouts on a year-on-year -year basis at 27. Again, 8% is the sector median, so looking a lot stronger. And we can see the earnings per share over the next three to five years, 40%, whereas the overall sector median at 11% is significantly lower. So it does look like, yes, valuation, it is costly, but the growth is significantly better. Then we move on to the profitability, where they get an A+. Very good margins, 81 versus the sector of 58 Bottom line, very good, 20%, whereas the sector median is negative 4%. And we also note cash from operations looking very, very good, 6 billion when the sector median negative 15 million burning cash. So overall, in terms of profitability and growth, Eli Lilly significantly better than the overall sector. And when we do a quick recap, double buy from Seeking Alpha and Wall Street, a hold from Quant, F on valuation, A plus on growth with an A plus on profitability. Now, two more things before we jump into the valuation. First one, comparing against others in the pharma industry. Let's see if there are any issues in isolation or in fact across the industry. And what we notice, total return, including dividends reinvested, Eli Lilly, even after the drop, is the best performing, up 23%. Over the last five years, again, the best performing, up 580 over the last 10 years, again, no one comes anywhere close. Very, very strong, 1,188. Bear in mind, though, past performance essentially doesn't tell us anything about the future. We also want to highlight the comparison against the S&P, which is, in fact, up over the last 12 months. 
Over the last five years and over the last 10 years, though, absolutely no competition. Eli Lilly has performed absolutely phenomenal. But remember, again, you can also always consider low-cost ETFs. If you don't have confidence, they can continue this outperformance. Now, let's jump into the valuation model. As always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided. Smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Now, how we got to our intrinsic value, $631, we ran it through the DCF model, which as we can see here, the free cash flow year on year, which essentially an average growth of negative 1%. We've gone for 20% today, which is at the lower end of the low, medium and high. With a discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by the shares outstanding, and as we can see, 631, which implies a downside of 12% to the current trading price. Now remember, these numbers are subjective and you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below, running through your own numbers, whether it's for Eli Lilly or any others that you do desire. But we'll show you for full transparency at the 25% rate, essentially intrinsic value 859, giving 19% upside. And for those that believe at 30%, $1,158.61%. Now we want to be a lot more conservative at the 20% level in today's episode. And based on that right now, we believe even after the 3 to 4% drop today, Eli Lilly is trading at a premium. Now, typically what we do on the channel is we add a 10% MOS where we execute on this if it meets our three golden criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward looking data. If you believe that for Eli Lilly, then we would say a buy around five, six, seven, and we can keep going depending on what MOS level we want. For example, add a 20% MOS around a buy at $504. As we said though, we believe this is trading at a premium. Granted, some people will be happy to pay for a premium for high quality companies. And Wall Street, on the other hand, don't agree with us at all. They believe this company will shoot up to well over $1,000 over the next year and giving that 46% upside. As always, though, give us your thoughts below. Maybe you disagree. Maybe you agree. Right now, though, we see this trading at a premium with 46% upside purely based on Wall Street and their expectations. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. Don't forget to sign up to the free weekly newsletter below and join us in the Patreon where we do talk about our weekly buys and sells. As always, have a great day and we'll see you all on the next one.